As we come to this session, I'd like to ask you to think in terms of everything that we have heard and then to see this session as a therefore. Think of all that we've heard about who God is and what he has done for us in Christ and we're going to think about it therefore. And actually this is the model of Titus 2 where we're told that Paul says to the pastor Titus, teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. And then he comes down in verse 3 and says that older women are to train younger women to live godly lives. And so what we're doing in this session is to take that sound preaching and teaching that we have heard. And we want to think specifically about the application to what does this mean for us as women in God's church. There are many areas of discipleship that are not gender specific. Many areas of service where we serve alongside men. But there are some areas that are gender specific. And the reason that we need gender specific ministries goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. God said, let us make man in our image. So God created man in his image male and female, he created them. The idea of gender distinctiveness is controversial today and you know that. There's a professor at Hunter College in New York City who teaches a course entitled Reimagining Gender. Her premise is that gender is a fiction. And this is how she begins her course each quarter. My working assumption in this course is that gender is already imaginary in the first place, meaning that it's a construction, a fiction that we all live and work with in our daily lives. In light of that, it's not surprising that it was just a few years ago I had spoken on biblical womanhood and a college woman afterwards asked me this question. How can I possibly think biblically about my womanhood when I'm constantly being told to seek my own self-fulfillment, to determine my own destiny, and that independence is power? I understood what she was asking me, and my answer to her was, get involved in the women's ministry in your church and go to godly women and ask them to speak the truth of womanhood into your life as a counterpoint to what you're hearing. But I trembled as I answered because I wondered, is the church that she is in equipping women for this calling? Because often women's ministries in the local church are personality, event, or task driven. And that will always fall short of what God has called us to be and to do in his church. The Bible gives us a gospel-driven approach to women's ministry. But it does demand that we understand what God says about womanhood and then that we disciple women in light of that. In Genesis 1:27, when God created man in his own image, male and female, he created them, this shouts to us that we are equal. Equality is not the issue. We are equally created in God's image. But that does not negate the fact of gender distinctiveness. In Genesis 1, in Genesis 2:18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. The first thing we need to see in this is that gender distinctiveness is God's idea. I will make a helper. Those two words, I will, we see them all through scripture saying to us over and over and over, God's sovereign initiative, God's sovereign grace. God designed man and woman to be different. We know that God assigned the position of headship to man in creating him first. This view that man and woman are equal but have been assigned by God different but equally valuable functions in his kingdom is known as complementarianism. By contrast, egalitarianism says that there is no difference of function between men and women, at least not one that would account for male spiritual headship. Because you see, 
difference in function is nonsensical to women who have been taught for decades that equality means sameness. So where do we come up with the idea that equality does not mean sameness? Our reference point is God himself. God is our reference point for everything. Think back to the last session, what we just heard. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have different functions in the accomplishment of our salvation, but yet there's perfect unity within the members of the Trinity. Those distinctions are not blurred. Which work is more important in our redemption? The Father choosing, the Son redeeming, or the Holy Spirit applying? They're equally valuable, equally needed. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are equal in substance and power, but each has a different function in our salvation. And yet, those functions work in such beautiful complementarity that it accomplishes one glorious work of redemption. Another thing that we can see in Genesis 2.18 is then to begin to look at our female calling, our function in God's kingdom. When God says that he will create a helper, we need to understand the biblical meaning of that word. Throughout the Old Testament, many times God is referred to as our helper. As we look at this, we begin to understand more about what it means to be a helper. For example, in Genesis 18, Moses said, my father's God was my helper. He saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. Here we see God helping us as the defender. In Psalm 10, you, O God, see trouble and grief. You consider it and take it in hand. The victim commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. A helper sees and responds to the needy and the afflicted. In Psalm 2, may he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. A helper supports. In Psalm 72, he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will rescue them from oppression. Psalm 86, you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. The helper comforts. These are strong, relational, nurturing, caring words. And this is what God has designed us as women to do. If you summarize these words, you might think of them in terms of these are words that nurture relationships, that nurture community among God's people, and they are caring words that extend compassion in a very practical way. These are covenant words because community and compassion are characteristic of the covenant community. They are gospel words. But the problem is the fall. It's noteworthy that Satan inverted the creation order and went to the woman first and questioned God's authority. In the fall, we lost our ability to be what God had created us to be, our ability to live in relationship with him and to reflect him. But the solution is the gospel. God came to the garden. He spoke to the serpent. And again, we see those wonderful I will words of God's sovereign initiative, his sovereign grace. Adam and Eve heard as God spoke to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his head. She will have an offspring. Adam and Eve would be restored to their relationship with God and thus to their ability to reflect him. Upon hearing this, Adam looks at his wife and he renames her. Up to that point, she'd been called woman. But in Genesis 3.20, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all living. Eve means life giver. In being restored to her relationship with God through the promise of a redeemer, her womanhood was restored. Being a life giver is not limited to biological birthing, or it would be limited to a married woman's reproductive years. We're called to be life givers in every season and every circumstance in life, and because of redemption in Christ, we can be. 
instead of being life takers, we can actually be life givers. The helper words are life giving words, but it's not natural to sinful man and woman. Our inclination is towards independence and individualism. The college woman that I mentioned was being discipled toward independence. She was being discipled to be a life taker. We need to step into that vacuum and to disciple women to be life givers. It's only the gospel that can liberate and motivate and empower us for such a calling. And Jesus said that his people are to be baptized and discipled within the context of the church to do all that he has commanded us to do. And one of those all things is to live out the implications of our womanhood. So that gives us the reason for a women's ministry, that we might disciple women in these areas. As we were thinking about what is the biblical strategy for how we go about doing women's ministry, I was writing a Bible study on the pastoral letters, the letters to Timothy and Titus. Those letters were written to those men in their capacity as pastors of a local church. And as I worked through those letters, it occurred to me that there are five passages scattered throughout them that speak to the topic of women, that speak specifically about women. And as Paul told Titus, the purpose of those letters is to tell us how we're to conduct ourselves in his church. And so as I looked at those five passages, I realized that there was the unfolding of a strategy for women's ministry that not surprisingly, but it is thrilling, exactly corresponds to God's creation of us as women. Those five principles are in, the first one is in 1 Timothy 2, and there's the passage where we're told that women are not to teach within the context of the, the worship services of the church, the, the authoritative preaching of God's word. So here we see the principle of ecclesiastical submission. A women's ministry is to be under the protection and the authority of the male headship of the church. But Paul goes on to give us the reason. It's not because of sin, but rather, as he says in the very next verse, for Adam was formed first and then Eve. This is to reflect the creation order, the way we function in God's church, the government of his church is to reflect that creation order. And then in 1 Timothy 3, in the passage dealing with the qualifications of the deacons, there's a verse there that speaks about their wives are women. The, the word can be translated either way, and so there's a little confusion about which way it should be translated, but as Dr. Dan Doriani has said, the church will live well even if we cannot finally resolve the proper interpretation of 1 Timothy 3.11 if we keep women deeply involved in diaconal work. The main thing is that women whom God calls to care for the needy do the work and help others to do the same. Why do we need to keep women involved in diaconal ministries? Because God has created us to be a helper. And so the, the principle here is the principle of compassion. And that's what we've been created to do. So a women's ministry needs to come alongside the diaconal, the mercy ministries of the church. And at whatever degree is appropriate in that particular situation to assist in those ministries, particularly those mercy ministries that are to women. And then in... 1 Timothy 5, it's an amazing passage where Paul describes community life, how that we're to function as a family. He begins that chapter, do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as if you were, he were your father. 
treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with absolute purity. We see this familial language. And then he goes on to give some examples of how we do that. And one is the care that we give to widows, but it's also that some of those widows who were qualified were to be set apart for ministry. And one commentator speaks of the things that these women are to do as the commonplace duties that were characteristic of the sanity of apostolic Christianity. Listen to those verses. No widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is over 60, has been faithful to her husband, and is well known for her good deeds such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the saints, helping those in trouble, devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. Here's a description of a women's ministry. And it's those things that I love the way he says that bring sanity, the ordinary domestic deeds that bring sanity into a family, both in the home and in the church. And then in Titus 2, we see the principle of gender-specific discipleship. Some discipleship is to be gender-specific. And in 2 Timothy 3, we see the principle of the sufficiency of Scripture, the foundation of Scripture to support all of this. That chapter gives us this wonderful contrast between lovers of self and lovers of God. And then to emphasize the point, Paul talks about weak-willed or childish, immature women who follow after the false teachers. That shows us the need for a women's ministry to disciple those women. But then he gives the contrast of women who were lovers of God as he talks about Lois and Eunice and the way they discipled Timothy. And he uses the memory of those women to Timothy to set up what may be one of the most comprehensive statements about the power of God's word to transform us from lovers of self to lovers of God. And then I'd like for us to look at an example of women who did just this. Women who were lovers of the Lord Jesus and who served him in ministries of community and ministries of compassion and who did it reflecting the creation order. In Luke chapter 8, after this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. The disciples were doing what God had called them to do. These women were helping to support them. Here is an example of a complementarian ministry. And then as we go on over to Matthew 27, the scene at the cross, many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. There's another of the helper words. And then we come to Mark 16, after the crucifixion and the burial. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. I love that they did not do this in isolation from one another, but a community of women. They functioned together. They went to the tomb. Anointing the body was a way of showing affection. This was a practical ministry of compassion. These women were driven to care for the body of Christ because they loved him. It was a dangerous thing to do. But they went, even after their 
their stressful situation of having witnessed the horror of the crucifixion, they came together and they went to do what needed to be done. Verse 3, as they walked to the tomb, they asked, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? I'm always left breathless at this verse because I see women who faced an obstacle that was too big for them. They knew there was an obstacle there that they were too weak to do anything at all about. But they went anyway because they loved Jesus. And what was the result? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place they have laid him, and go and tell. Here's the very essence of a women's ministry. We know that when we care for the body of Christ, the church of the Lord Jesus, there will be obstacles that are too big for us to remove. Usually these obstacles for me are the sin in my own heart, my sin of fear, of feeling inadequate, which I am, of um, just being afraid. Sometimes the obstacles are the difficulty of ministering to others. Sometimes it's hard to minister to other people. And sometimes the obstacle is the task itself. We feel totally inadequate for the task. But when we go anyway, because we love Jesus, we too will know that amazing reality of the power of the resurrected Christ shining the light of himself upon us. And sometimes we will see his glory in the most unexpected places and the most unexpected people. Women's ministry is about anointing the body of Christ because we love him, because he first loved us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your church, your bride. Father, I thank you that you are making your church glorious, pure, without spot or wrinkle. And I thank you that you have called us to serve you as women in your church. And Father, I thank you for the men who are here. We need them to understand our calling because we need them to give us the oversight and the protection and the context to serve you. Lord, it is not about us. It is about you. It is about the advancement of your kingdom. And our prayer is that you will be glorified. In the name of Jesus, amen.